Welcome everyone today. We are going to dive into a wonderful conversation with such an important person who is making an impact on the continent of Africa. I am here today with Professor Obedele Bakari Kambon, who moved from the US to Ghana many, many years ago. He is somebody who's, he's not new to the game. We hear so many stories about people who are just making the move and coming to Ghana, but he is in fact somebody who not only moved to the country, he has um, really become a Ghanaian because he, he learned to speak languages that some people who even were born and raised in Ghana don't even speak some of these languages. So he's really done a really great job. And so he has this amazing conference coming up from September 6th to the 8th. And this is the second time that he's doing this conference. And it is so important for us as a people. It, it is the second annual Abibitumi Conference on Black Power. And it has so many object objectives that it's going to reach not only me, but you as well. If you can make it in person, that's wonderful. If you can, I'm sure that there are options of you being able to participate in the conference. And we're also gonna talk about him honoring his late father, uh, Nana Kamau Kambon, and what his contributions were to the African continent and to black people as a whole. Thank you so much for taking the time out today to have this conversation. Absolutely. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, you know, we've uh, worked together, been on panels together in the past, so it's good to uh, link up again. Uh, initially, you were going to come here, so we were all uh, excited about that. You know, we had pounded the fufu and got everything right. Oh! <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah, you missed out. <laughs> but, you know, this is what you see as my background. This is actually a bb 2 me headquarters which is, you know, done in the style of the Upper East, the Bomborisi uh, painting that they do uh, there. Uh, really, I would say one of the most, if not the most pan-African structures on the continent intentionally. So, uh, so you know, we are definitely inviting you to the Abibi Tumi conference. We'd love to have you. Maybe you can cover it. You know, I'm sure uh, those who are following you, your viewers would love to check things out. But yeah, so this is the yeah, Abibi Tumi conference coming up. It should be very Black powerful. Uh, last year, we had a concert component. We had uh, Pura Khan, you know, a young artist who was our headliner for the concert. Uh, we had presenters from all throughout the world. Uh, Baba James Small, who some of your viewers may be familiar with. Uh, Baba Wade Nobles, who, you know, viewers may be familiar with. Um, Nana Nketsia V was part of our award ceremony. He's the Almighty of Isikado. Um, Deputy Chair to the former Deputy Chair to the AU, Nikwesi Kwati, a good uh, friend of ours. Um, just so many luminaries came through. Black Rasta uh, came through and you know honored us with his presence. Just so many people that you know this year you don't want to miss it. There will be even more. Uh, Nana Baina Bello out of IT will be participating. Just like the list is endless in terms of those who are very serious about Black Power and making it happen. And with a BB to me, what you see again is a BB to me headquarters in the background that this is presented as a model of what black power can look like. So, for example, we're operating entirely on solar. So whereas everyone's complaining about ECG, it brings up the point of, all right, well, can't we be self-sufficient in terms of our own uh, energy sources? Wow. Um, we're not dependent on Ghana water. As a matter of fact, where we are, there are no pipes for Ghana water to even come out this far. So what we do, we have a water catchment system. And that means anytime it rains, then, you know, that's the water that we're using with two filters that we're using for everything. Wow. Right? So, exactly. I really have to come and check that out. You have to wow. check it out. We have the solar borehole here. So that means so when it rains, we get water. But then the solar borehole that at, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., as, as long as the sun is shining, then it's pumping water into 20,000 gallon cistern. So the water catchment is 20,000 gallons. The uh, water borehole is uh, 20,000 gallons. So, you know, if we're interested in black power and a BB2 me translates to black power, how can we talk about black power when we're living entirely dependent on other people for our very water, for our power, for anything else? So, you know, again, once you come here, part of the idea is to inspire others um, with actual real life models, because we could go, we can get up on a platform and, you know, give eloquent lectures and so forth and so on. But at a certain point, people will ask, okay, well, uh, if you're interested in building Africa, quote unquote, then where's your building? <laughs> if you're interested yeah. in, you know, black power, all right, well, how's that manifest? If you're living, you know, I don't I don't even know, 
off in uh, Councilman somewhere in air conditioning in a place built by the Lebanese. How does that mesh together? So here, even the structure itself is mud blocks. So when you look at it, you'll say, oh, it's beautiful. This is a traditional architectural you know, technique that we use for it um, in terms of even the eight sizes coming from various creation stories and the worldview there. Um, what you see here, this is from Benin, this image. Uh, at the very top, you have Heru, which is from classical Kemet. So, you know, there's a lot of meaning in the structure itself. Um, on the inside, you have Bogolan, which is mud cloth. Uh, so, you know, it's very, like I said, it's intentional in terms of quote unquote Pan-Africanism. Uh, and again, that's so that we could actually have real life models of what does black power look like. When people hear it, people have all types of different concepts. Oh, well, black power is, you know, having a, a black image of Jesus. Well, black power is this or black. So, you know, what what is it really and what various people who have thoughts about black power look like? What are those models? What are the best practices where it comes to? We also have a biogas digester and that's so that we don't have to go and buy LPG that, you know, and it's very easy to do. Actually, you can get any poly tank, um, you know, and you can use the uh, kitchen scraps and things, uh, you know, just anything that's organic that can rot that you can use that, that produces methane gas, and that methane gas is something that you can cook with. So again, it goes beyond just giving lectures and talking and saying, oh, black power, oh, black liberation, and blah, blah, blah. what does it look like, right? And, you know, again, what we've done at this place is to provide a model, but we're not at the end goal. The end goal isn't, oh, well, we're living sovereign, and, you know, we have our own thing, and we're controlling. Well, you know, at a certain point, it comes down to what does total liberation look like for Black people? especially where we have enemies in the world, what does that really look like for black people? And how can we make sure that anything we build doesn't become Tulsa, Oklahoma? Because you can see Tulsa, Oklahoma, okay, well, they had quote unquote sovereignty, that's Black Wall Street, for those who may not yeah. be familiar. But okay, well, yeah, they had sovereignty to a degree in a certain box, but as soon as their enemies said, all right, we're gonna bomb that out of existence, well, then what happens? Well, what happens when we take that same concept on a global scale? Let's, have, let's say that the entire continent has quote unquote sovereignty. What prevents the entire co continent from becoming just another Tulsa, Oklahoma with a black Wall Street where as soon as they decide that, okay, that's enough sovereignty for you people, then it's done. So, you know, this is actually going beyond those types of discussions towards what's our end game? What's our end goal? And that's something that my father, Nana Kamal Kamban, always spoke about was, you know, a solution to the number one problem on the planet Earth. Uh, if we see that they're committing genocide against our people, and if you look at the UN definition of genocide, that's killing members of the group, that's causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, we definitely qualify for both of those. That's bringing about conditions to destroy the group in whole or in part. Yeah, I think we definitely qualify for that. That is preventing births within the group. That's also forcibly tra transferring children of the group to another group. So if by all five parts of the definition of genocide, we're subjected to that, well, how do we now build up the power where our enemies and, you know, people try to go deep psychologically. Well, they do it because uh, they have low self-esteem or because, you know, they fear genetic annihilation of this or that. But ultimately, as Nana Amos Wilson said, they do it because they can. And, you know, in Chi, when you say to me, that's to say can. You're able to do something to me called like I can go or I'm able to go. And from there, that's where you get the noun to me, which translates to power. So you can think about power as the ability to do something. You can do something. So it now comes down to, well, if they do it because they have the power to do so, they can do so, they're able to do so, then how do we ensure that we have the power to not only prevent them uh, you know, on a short scale, but also permanently where we can prevent that from happening? So uh, we have the documentary, uh, Quiet Warrior documentary, and um, I know you have the link to that as well. So. Um, this is a documentary about my father, Nana Kamal Kamban, who some people will know him from. He taught for 18 years at uh, an HBCU in um, North Carolina. Some people know him from that. We also have Black Magnificent Books and More in the New Cultural Center in North Carolina, where we brought in speakers like Nana Kwame Ture. Uh, we brought in, you know, anyone you can imagine, uh, Nana, uh, Dr. Ben. Some people who are scholars will know about him in terms of history. Um, Nana Anthony Browder, you know, spoke there several times. So anybody you can think of 
they passed through those doors and oftentimes they stayed at a house. So I just grew up around all these luminary people. So wow. people, especially in the North Carolina uh, area, they know him for that. Other people know him from, okay, you know, he gave a speech on C-SPAN or they heard him here, they heard him there. But, you know, essentially he was somebody who really prioritized action over just, you know, mere words. And that's why, we, you know, his name, Kamal, Quiet Warrior, he got that name at my parents' wedding ceremony that rather than exchanging blood diamond rings, they decided that this name encapsulates your character, your spirit, and who you are. You know, that's what my mother said to my father. My father did the same for my mother. And that is what they exchanged as their wedding gifts to each other. So the name Kamal is coming from Kikuyu. It translates to quiet warrior. So, you know, that's who he was because he was somebody who, you know, all the things that I've talked about with Abibi Tumi, all of that really comes from my father um, and my mother as well, because they built their own log cabin in the woods. They left Brooklyn, New York to build their own log cabin in the woods with their own hands, with log, uh, with logs, uh, with chainsaws in the rain, doing their own roofing, because they're like, if we're saying that we're trying to get free, then we have to actually make that be the case. So they did that. They moved away from you know, in New York, you can go to a thousand lectures where people are speaking eruditely on Uhuru and black liberation and, you know, getting free and so forth. But everybody in New York is using uh, the New York water system, <laughs> municipal water. Everybody in New York is dependent on the New York municipal system for electricity. Everybody is dependent on groceries. Every single aspect of your life, you're dependent on the same people who you say that you're fighting against. So that didn't make sense to my parents and it doesn't make sense to me. So you know, for them, they said we have to go beyond just the mere rhetoric and we have to actually live it out. So growing up, we had our own garden. That's why, you know, here at a bb me headquarters, when you come, we're talking about actual models. So we have, you know, our own plantain that we grow. We have our own uh, bananas that we grow, our own soursop, our own mangoes, our own coconuts. We have, you know, all of these different uh, things, our own peppers, our own cocoa yam That's and, you know, consumers. You would have loved the food if you came. So next time, don't don't worry. We will we'll keep yeah, it warm next for time you. I have, I, have to, I have to do it when I have a whole day free because I don't exactly. want to feel rushed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you got to so, run up out of here. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're we were talking about uh, what your parents did as far as with the growing of the food. The the interesting thing is for me growing up in in Canada, my mm. mom always tried to have a little bit of an element of that she would with her mm. life growing up in her hometown in the Eastern region, because um, mm. she grew up with her grandmother. And so she learned how to do some of these things mm. in Canada when we could right. during the spring and summer season, she was exactly. growing, we had corn, we had mm. strawberries, raspberries, we had onions, wow. we had green peppers. Uh, occasionally, sometimes we have tomatoes if they would grow enough, but she mm -hmm. did her best to grow some of these things that we had That's in right. our backyard. So she'd be That's like, right. I'm going to the back to go get some onions. I'm going to the back exactly. to go get some tomatoes and green peppers. So it was it was kind of cool That's having how that. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of cool having that. People think we don't grow things in Canada, but you can in the right season. Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I also had a garden in Wisconsin, which is, you know, getting close to that side where I had so many yeah. tomatoes that I actually had buckets of it. I had to give it away to people. And, you know, oh. this is the thing we're all, you know, crying about, you know, the CD and, you know, inflation and all of these things and how expensive food is. Um, but it makes sense, you know, for those who can to, you know, just plant some seeds. And, you know, where we are right now is so fertile. So, you know, we're here in Equipem, uh, Mampong, in the eastern region. Yeah, the eastern and region is fertile. It's so fertile. Like, literally, you'll spit out watermelon seeds. And now we literally got two watermelons on the vine on this side of the house. <laughs> that weren't even planted in the garden. The garden is on this side. The watermelons are growing on that side because I guess my son was there, you know, eating spit. And we have huge watermelons just, you know, coming up naturally. We got wow. tomtombre all over. So we decided to have a meal that's just, you know, mancani. So that's the cocoa yam. That's the root underneath. And then the tomtombre, which is the leaf that grows on. And literally our meal is coming from like right outside. And like, how yeah. do you, you have to beat that, right? Your breakfast is the soursop tree. Oh, is is right now. But again, if we're really serious about black power, that's how we're living. But it's not enough to tell other people how they're supposed to live. Oh, you know, we need to have all one common language and we need to do this and we need to do that. 
then you ask the person, well, are you doing that? Well, uh, uh, no, no, no. So for us, it's like, let's actually do it. And then after we do it and have a model, now we'll start, start to talk to other people about how we did it. How can you build with architecture that's coming from our worldview that incorporates the cosmology and the creation stories of the Dogon, of the Yoruba, of the Bambara, of the Basongi of Congo, of classical Kemet? How do you get all of that of Benin, the you know, Fongbe speaker, all of these things? How do you get that into a structure? Well, now this is black power in the area of architecture. All the things we're talking about, well, now that's black power in the area of agriculture. All right. Well, all the things I'm talking about, well, that's black power in the area of power, right? Energy, you know, electricity generation. This is black power in the area of, you know, your own water supply. We, we drive Kantankas here. So all the cars that we have are Kantankas. Well, now this is on the side of technology because it's not, oh, well, we got to go back and try to be like we were in the year 1200 AD. Well, now it's, it's really about the spirit of black power. What does that look like in terms of the phones that we use? We use phones that are made in Rwanda. What does that look like in terms of the cars that we drive? Well, that's the Kantanka that we drive. So really it's about getting, and this is one thing that my father used to always talk about, was getting all of your different selves in order. And that's like in terms of your psychology, you have people who are really great in terms of psychology, but you know they have self-esteem or whatever, but they have a pot belly. This means that their health self isn't together, but how do they get all of their selves, their different selves on point in an alignment? Or you know maybe they never read. So how do you get your education self you know, in alignment? How do you get your social self in alignment where you can call on people like the great Ivy Prosper? And she's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm gonna come over here. Yeah, I'm gonna come and check you out. And, you know, so these are just different aspects of getting all of your different selves together. My father wrote a book called Black Guerrilla Warfare in America. And it was really about just that topic. So the conference itself is uh, categorized in that area. So we have those who are giving presentations on the psychological aspects of black power. You have those who are giving uh, presentations in terms of the health aspect of black power. You have those that are giving presentations in terms of the political, which is what we tend to think about, right? The political side of right. black power, the side of black power, because there are all these areas of human activity. And what we oftentimes do is we'll just focus on one area and think, well, that's it. Well, I know a yeah. lot about health and I eat quinoa and I do this and I do that. So I'm done. But, you know, yeah. Baba Kamal will talk about it like it's like a train that's going. You get to the train stop and then people say, oh, I've reached the health train stop. So I'm done. And they get off. But when you understand that our goal is black liberation, then you know that yeah, that is very important, but that's not the end of everything. There could even be a foundation because if you don't have health, then what else are you really doing? But then, you know, all right, well, now the social side. Okay, well, the political side. Okay, the education side. Okay, the linguistic side. All of these different aspects, it's about getting all of those different selves together. So when people come to the uh, conference, they will be blown away, like literally mind blown in terms of not just where it's going, the venue I've talked about as a model, but then the models that other people are bringing up. We had folks uh, coming from Benin last year, Marin Perja, who live entirely off the grid, right? They live in a forest where they built all their own stuff, just like how we're talking about my parents did. That's how Marin Perja did in Benin. So they're actually, and they, we uh, gave them an award, Marja actually, she passed away, you know, after the uh, first uh, Baby to Me conference on Black Power. And I was very happy that gave her an award and gave her her flowers while she was here. I'm not happy she's yeah. passed away, of course. But, you know, you have so many who, after they pass on, is when, oh, they were a great person and oh, blah, blah, blah. They did this, they did that. That, you know, for my father as well, you know, we also presented him uh, with an award, uh, both Mare and Perja, which is a couple, an elder couple. And then my father, Nana Kamal Kanban and Nana Mawia Kanban, uh, we gave them an award as well, a citation certificate as well. So, you know, it's very powerful when you know that these things that you're seeing going on in the BB Tumi are not cut off and segmented and fragmented, but you have people in Benin who are doing very similar things. You know, they have an entire swath of land that they're growing their own food. They have a school that they built with their own two hands. And that's where they're educating, you know, children. So, you know, it's very powerful when you have people who are, you know, coming out of Atlanta who are doing amazing things. Those in the uh, Volta region, Liatewati, you have the Kazi project there. You have Black people from throughout the entire world 
coming together, not just to talk shop about black power, but this is how we're implementing it. This is what we've done. And this is how you can participate in what we're doing. Or you can replicate where you are because maybe somebody in Uganda can't come to Volta region every two weeks. So, OK, well, how can you replicate it? This is where you get those ideas. This is where you get those contacts. Oh, and um, speaking of which, I just met a brother who was doing major things in terms of solar. Right. And that's a connection that came about, you know, coming as a consequence of the, uh, BB, the first bb 2 me conference on black power. We have those who are doing 3D printing, a brother based out of Texas who, you know, is doing amazing things in terms of producing everything that we need, where it comes down to engines, whether it comes down to, you know, plastics, you name it. So when you come to the bb 2 me conference on black power, it's about black power lived as a lived reality going from vision to actual reality. So I definitely to invite people to uh, come to the bb 2 me conference and the link is there conference.bb2me.com and that's where you can sign up as a as a presenter as a participant if you you know want to come and hear and experience it and network and interact uh, we have artists last year I, I mentioned pure Khan was there as our headliner um this year you know there's a, a, a friend of mine i was actually at his house a couple of days ago for dinner uh fuse odg who some of your our listeners will, our viewers will know, and where he has an app called Sona, which is just amazing, and a School of New Africa mm. app, and uh, he's going to be unveiling that very shortly. And we're in discussion about well, how can we uh, collaborate, right? So he has that app. We have the BB Tumi app as well. So you know, we're actually uh, collaborating with a lot of very, very powerful people who are making moves. Some of which you may have heard about and know about; others you may not. So the conference is, you know, paid the festival. We have a festival side that includes vendors. It has a fashion show. It has an art exhibition. It has games for children. We, last year we had the bouncy castle and the trampoline that the children love. So it's really exposing the children to black power from an early age. So it's not, oh, well, yeah, back uh, Nana Kwame Nkrumah gave speeches about something. And yeah, that's it. Now we're done. Yeah. Well, yeah. what do we see now? it is very helpful to have our children in spaces like this because when they even see, well, this is this model, this is that model, this is what they're doing in Rwanda, this is what they're doing in IT, this is what they're doing in the UKKK and Kukulets, Canada, in the United States, you name it, then now they can even be inspired to, well, I can even do more to continue in that same vein. So that's what it's all about in terms of the conference. And the conference is part of the Sankofa journey. And the Sankofa journey, this is a 26th year, 26 years of the Sankofa journey, and it is sankofajourney.com. I love that you are on point. Man, Ivy, you are so prosperous. This is you, you know. <laughs> so the Sankofa journey. You know? I, I, wanted, I wanted to just make sure that I'm, you know, keeping it up, keeping up with you, keeping up with you. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're so on point, man. Don't ever let anyone tell you different. So <laughs> um, the Sankofa journey, that's how I came to Ghana my first time. That was in 1998. And that's when my mother started it. And wow. anything you see me do, you can see how that journey, the Sankofa journey had a life transforming impact on me. If you see that I am a professor at the University of Ghana, multi award winning, by the way, um, just yesterday, I was mentioning that I won the uh, Provost Publications Award for the best published work in the humanities at the entire University of Ghana. So I'm competing Fantastic. against the best professors and you name it. And uh, this is the third time that they've had this award ceremony and I've won awards at two of them. So two out of three ain't bad. I won a three out of three, but we'll That's get great. It. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just doing, them. if you see me here, I'm doing amazing things. This professor, I'm in school as Bamuchi Domhene here at Equipe Mampon, that all of that came from coming on the Sankofa journey. And I always say inspiration is showing people possibilities. Inspiration is just showing people possibilities that, you know, for the Sankofa journey, exactly. And this is a site that you see, you know, we've had over the years, dozens, if not hundreds of people who have come on the Sankofa journey, just experiencing Ghana, experiencing the taste of the food. Uh, experiencing the sights, experiencing going around and learning the language, right? There's that component of it as well. Meeting people like the Insuman Kwaheni of all of us, auntie. Meeting people like, um, you know, just luminaries from traditional rulers to spiritual healers and diviners 
We do nature walks with actually learning the indigenous herbs, um, you know, just all around Ghana, see natural sites such as the waterfalls, uh, of course, you know, in Accra, so that people can see everything from the city to the rural, and they can get a holistic experience. And then once they come on the Sankofa journey, the next step is repatriate to Ghana.com. So through that, we've helped, you know, so many people buy land. We've helped people purchase uh, vehicles and ship vehicles. We've also, you know, helped people even get citizenship. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, the push for citizenship is not a new thing. So I got citizenship in 2016. And all of that actually came from um, one of the people who came to the award ceremony at a bb to me conference last year, Honorable Nikwe Sikwate, who was the executive secretary to President Mahama. And he came to one of the meetings that we were having uh, at uh, African Studies. And one thing that came up in the meeting was, you know, as diasporans, we contribute a lot, but we don't get a lot back. You know, literally millions and millions come into the economy. Uh, we're not coming here, you know, beggar, as beggars with a handout uh, at the uh, corner. And you say, oh, that must be a diasporan because he's begging for money. That's not how we're coming. If we're coming, we're usually coming because we want to have an impact on the continent. We want actually want to build this land and, you know, Ghana and beyond. So when we do that, you know, there's definitely a, a, a value proposition in terms of the value that we bring to Ghana. The year of return alone, I understand, was something like $1.9 billion, right? So through Repatriate to Ghana, yeah, you can close out from there. But through Repatriate to Ghana, through that first meeting, um, Nikwe Sikwati, the executive, Sec Honorable Nikwe Sikwati, he went back to President Mahama and his last act, and to put it in his terms, he says, I'm not giving you anything. I am restoring your birthright that your citizenship is your birthright. And there in that photo, that photo was actually taken uh, by uh, Nana, uh, His Excellency Nana Kufuado's people. And he put that uh, image on his Facebook page, right? So that's our whole family in 2019 when we got citizenship as part of the year of return. Um, so that initiative is building on, and you know, at the time we didn't know how far it would go because wow. literally these are just meetings with students, community members, activists, and so forth right there in my office at African Studies. And then from there, it became the 2016 citizenship ceremony. From there, we now see the year of return and others getting citizenship. We've had that happen several times and we've had constant advocacy and that's where affairs, I have to give props to uh, Honorable uh, Mr. Uh, Kwesi Abebiu, um, who is the director there at Diaspora Affairs because he would always come out to the community, those of us uh, from the diaspora, and get feedback. And because of those consultations, one thing that we said is that citizenship shouldn't just be ad hoc uh, on the whim of the president. It should actually be part of a policy. And then even if a new administration comes in, they know that this is a set policy. And that ended up being the reality for the diaspora engagement policy, which now has citizenship in it. When they first brought it to us, it did not have citizenship in it. It had uh, Emancipation Day and Panifest so that you can get in touch with your roots and then you go back. OK, well, that's fine. But tourism, nothing wrong with tourism. We love tourism. <laughs> You're part of the tourism authority. We love tourism. But what about those who don't just want to come here and spend a thousand dollars and then go back and then spend a million dollars the rest of their life with their mortgage and their car note and their uh, health care and everything else? What about that million dollars? What if we had that million dollars here in Ghana? Right but not just in terms of monetary, what about the brain gain of what this person is bringing? Because I know people who've repatriated who are diamond cutters, right? I know those who have IT expertise. I know people in every single aspect. What if rather than building up, uh, you know, the United Snakes of a murderer, what if instead of bring, uh, building up Ku Klux Klanada, what if instead of, you know, building up the UKKK, they're actually here on the ground and they're building up Ghana? You understand that this will have an impact on you know your children, Ivy, my children, this will have an impact on our great grandchildren, and we can't even quantify or even conceptualize the depth of impact that this can have across generations. And then it has an impact for them too, because they don't have to worry about being the next George Floyd with a knee on their neck. You understand? They don't have to be uh, worried about being the next Eric Garner and I can't breathe or any of these tragic things. Because guess what? They don't have enough of a white police force to put a knee on your neck here in Ghana. You understand? So it's, it's not just about running from danger. It's about running to safety. And, you know, this is a place where you're not worried about your son having a, a toy gun. 
didn't get shot down like Tamir Rice or your daughter or going is to the wrong, the wrong doorbell or be on the wrong doorbell or Amadou Jallo. And this is why I say it's not a thing of continental versus diaspora because they didn't ask Amadou Jallo for his passport before they shot him umpteen times. Exactly. His passport is his skin. And they said, guess what? This is the land of white people and we're going to make it that way. And you're going to find out with these 40 some odd bullets that we're going to 50 some odd bullets that we're going to uh, send through you. But here in Ghana, not only do you have a different experience for yourself as an individual, and it's not even a selfish thing, it's that your children will be able to be safe in a way that they will never be safe in the United States or any of these other places that we're coming from. Uh, and my, I, I, I went to uh, Canada one time, and that was Toronto. And uh, at the airport, I remember that everybody was going through, all the white people were going through, and then they said, oh, we're just doing a random check, and then you're black, they put you over to one side. This is for a conference. My mother, uh, we're going for the Association of Black Psychologists Conference, professional organization, so forth. And what they were doing, they were tracing the Underground Railroad backwards. So they started off in Canada. They ended up going to Chicago, various cities, until they ended up in Charleston, South Carolina. And then the year that my mother was the president, that's Nana Mawia Kamba, was the year that we came to Ghana. And she brought over 500 psychologists here to Ghana. It was a powerful experience. Um, at the end of the conference, that's the year that I did a year of study abroad at University of Ghana. It changed my whole trajectory. I started learning chi, and now I'm teaching chi at the University of Ghana. So you can see the impact that that had on me. But you know, really, what I'm getting at is that it's about black people, regardless of location, which was what originally Pan African Pan Africanism was about. Because when you can have this conversation, that's where we can see how we can help each other because our collective enemies don't want us to even talk, much less help each other, which is why they'll tell continental Africans, oh, if you go to the US on your visa lottery, don't hang out with the black people because they're all thugs and they're all prostitutes and they're all drug dealers and they're all this and they're all... So the, many of the continental Africans, they only have white friends. So they come back, they sound like Becky Sue because yeah, dude, like I was only around white people. So like I never met... And that's coming from what they show you in the music videos and what they show you in Boys in the Hood and Minutes of Society and Juice and you name it. That's the image that they project. But then for those of us in the diaspora, we never want to talk to Africans. As a matter of fact, if you call me an African and growing up, then it's fighting words, right? Because we yeah, see Ethiopia yeah. and the children who are starving and, oh, feed the children. And they got distended bellies and flies all over, the, all over their face. That's one. Or they all got HIV, or they're all warlords, um, you know, and so, so forth. So the image that we have of continental Africans is that why yeah. in the world would I ever want to associate with those poverty-stricken people? You know, yeah. they were swinging from trees. So then we never have a conversation, and because of that, we never know. Well, why did they show you on the continent those images of us, and why did they show us in the diaspora those images of the continent? And at the end of the day, we yeah. never meet. Well, the yeah, BB2Me conference is a place where we actually do meet. And then you'll find out the great works that are going on. For example, Habersha in Atlanta, that they're doing amazing things with urban agriculture or the amazing things that are going on. Like I mentioned, Marin Pair job there in uh, Benin. Or you'll never know about, you know, the amazing things that we're doing right here at BB2Me in terms of language, in terms of capoeira. That's our combat sciences. In terms of just, you know, the various aspects. So... I think I'll pause. I, um, I could literally go on all day, but I know you don't have all day, nor do I. But, um, you know, maybe we can go into the statue unveiling of my father. We're going to do that at the conference. Yeah. Conference. yeah. yeah. Talk yes. about that. You're, um, you know, you're, for, I want to know what, what made you decide to honor your father at the conference this year? Very good. So what, what I'll say is that uh, there are a lot of people who grow up in quote unquote conscious households, right? Where their parents are lecturers or authors or, you know, any aspect of these things. Um, and I, like I said, all throughout my life, I've grown up around very famous people who've written books and done so forth and so on. But I always had more respect for my father than I had for many, because what I knew is that my father was genuine and sincere in his commitment to black liberation, right? Not that he was perfect or any, whatever, uh, but that's one thing that I always respected about my father more than anybody else. Because again, like I'm saying, a lot of people will talk about black liberation, 
But then the next time you see them, they're in the three piece suit, you know, eating KFC with somebody who's read zero books. And my point has always been that if you've read a thousand books, you know, you're a scholar, you've read a thousand books and you're doing the exact same thing as the person who's read zero books. And then what's the point of your thousand books? But for my father, anything that he ever said that he was about, you could see, you know, expressed in how he's living from how he's dressing to where he spends his money to how he built his own house to how he's growing his own food, to how we have a mechanized well, so we have our own water coming from a spring under the ground. Like every single thing, he's not spending money on, you know, a luxury car. We, you know, growing up, we were actually embarrassed because we didn't understand it, but he had a Datsun 210. Datsun was what it was before it was Nissan. So this a little putt-putt <laughs> little car, but he was like, I'm not giving yeah. my money to rich our enemies. And that that's a behavioral thing that once you understand it as a child, once you understand it, you have to respect it, right? Because he's a professor at the university. He could has a doctorate from an Ivy League school, Columbia University, all these things. He could put on airs and say, oh, yeah, I'm the great professor. But he said, I am about black liberation, and it doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, it's not to diss anybody. Somebody's riding around in a Mercedes right now. Well, I don't agree with you. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I'm just saying that this is for somebody who is his child. I can see he's very serious and he's very sincere about what he says that he's about because he could have bought a Mercedes rather than opening up a bookstore and cultural center. He could have bought a BMW. He could have taken vacation to Greece or Rome. He could have done any of those things. But every single aspect of his life from my birth that I can attest to all the way up to, you know, December of 2023, everything in his life was being a quiet warrior. And just being about what he said that he's about in every aspect of his life, even when people aren't looking, right? You know, nobody knows that we don't have a furnace that we're paying bills to white people, but we're rather out chopping wood in the cold because we have a wood stove to keep the house warm, right? Yeah. People don't know that, and people will never see that, and people will never even hear about that. And even if they do, nobody's going to clap and give you a standing ovation for that. But that was just, I'm committed to being about Black liberation. This means I'm going to do for self. This means that I'm growing up in a rural environment right beside my father. And we got chainsaws, we got a mall, and we got an axe. And that's how we're heating our household. So maybe you can show the trailer if your uh, audio is Yeah, there. I was going to do that. Yeah. Black Swirling. So I'll Just pause. Take, I'll a, pause. take a look at this trailer. Dear, come back to you. I'll be before Black people. To the entire Black world, our Black family. I hope this message finds you well and in good spirits. And we are here to share with you an exciting opportunity to join us in honoring the Blacknificent life of our quiet warrior, Nana Kamal Kanban. The Kanban family and abb2me.com are thrilled to announce the production of Quiet Warrior, this magnificent legacy of Nana Kamal Khan. It's a documentary film that will illuminate the remarkable journey of a true solution and advocate for total ability for liberty, Black liberation. Nana Kamal Kanban's story is one of resilience, determination, an unwavering commitment to Abibi Fahodi, Black liberation and Abibi Tumi, Black power. Through Quiet Warrior, we aim to celebrate his unparalleled contributions and inspire audiences with his enduring legacy. However, bringing this project to fruition requires support from individuals like you who share our passion for preserving history and uplifting underrepresented voices. Your contribution will directly impact the success of our endeavor, enabling us to cover essential production costs, such as filming, editing, and distribution. Whether you donate a little or a lot, every contribution counts and brings us one step closer to sharing Nana Kamal Kanban's story with the entire Abibi Riasi, that is to say the entire Black world, so we ask you to join us in honoring the quiet warrior whose impact reverberates through generations. 
Together, let's ensure that Nana Kamal Kamba's legacy shines brightly for all of us. If you have any questions or you have any additional comments or would like any additional information, you can email and reach out to us at support at abibitumi.com. Thank you for considering our request and for your commitment to honoring and preserving the enduring legacy of Nana Kamal Kamba. With our deepest gratitude, the Kanban family and abibitumi.com. So it, it continues from there to the actual trailer. So that's our introduction to the trailer. But if you are also ah, not sure, okay. you're so like, OK, I thought back. we were done. It, we, we fake people out with that. <laughs> Yeah, let me, let me bring it back. Let me bring it back. No problem. I am Kamal Kanban. There's a priestess from Ghana that gave me a name, Kwesi Ajemain. And Kwesi Ajemain translates to Savior of the Nation. So as Kamal Kwesi Ajemain Kanban, I greet you with the words Black Liberation, Abibi Fahodie. Abibi Fahodie is from Ghana, a tree word, which translates to black liberation. And black liberation is our African gold standard. That's G-O-A-L, G-O-L-D. So I greet you with black liberation. Miles Davis, the great trumpet player I mentioned earlier, has a, a album live in Paris and I think in that al on that album, he says, he whispers with his raspy voice, this is your life. And so I'm giving you a sweep of my life. I didn't start at this, with this understanding. I didn't start out like this. I started out playing, you know, roller skating, playing skelly and stickball and all that. I never even thought about black liberation. Over the years, I developed, I developed, I evolved. The more you de-whitenize, the closer you become to the pure spirit that you should be. And the closer you get to that pure spirit, the closer you get to black liberation. Yeah, wow. So this, yeah, definitely this will be a very poignant documentary. And when you go to the link, uh, when your viewers go to the link, they'll see ways that they can also become a producer of the documentary. So that's what the introduction was all about, is that there are different tiers and different levels of investing in the documentary. And what you'll see is that for each level, uh, what you get, the benefits that come with investing in the documentary, uh, everything from credits to uh, coming to the premiere, tickets for the premiere, uh, you name it. So uh, with progressively higher levels, there are more and more benefits that come along with that. But we definitely, um, you know, invite people to uh, go to the link, to share the link with others, and then also check out the different levels of different tiers. Um, we've spoken about it on a few occasions. So there are uh, previous discussions that we've held about the Quiet Word documentary. Alongside also the uh, director, it's interesting, the director himself said that he knew of my father years uh, before he actually met him. Uh, and oh. he met him to do the recording of the raw footage, right? But he knew of my father because back in 2005, af after Hurricane Katrina, uh, my father gave a talk um, in this post-Katrina thing they did at Howard University where, you know, he went into his background, his upbringing, his philosophy of life, and he presented a solution to the problem, the number one problem on the planet Earth, which he identified as, quote unquote, white people. And, you know, the director at that time was much younger, of course. And he, he said that he was on his father's bed. He was like, who is that? I need to meet. I got to find that guy. And then things just came full circle that he ended up being the one to do the raw footage and is now on as the director for uh, the Quiet Warrior documentary. But very a lot of people have come to me over the years and said that when they heard that speech, it changed their entire life trajectory. They said it was the most wow. powerful speech that they had ever heard in their entire life. And they didn't know that a black person could speak like that. And interestingly, it was on live TV that was beamed all throughout the world. And he was saying things that, you know, 
people were very much blown away by. But he said that we have to come up with a once and for all solution to the number one problem on the planet Earth. And, um, you know, it was just very, very profound for many. But again, like I said, some people only know him for that speech, right? It ended up going, quote unquote, viral. I would say it went medicinal. Is that, is that speech online somewhere? Yeah, you can find it online. So if you type in his name and type in C-SPAN, then it, it ended up causing like an uproar all throughout the world. Because like here's a university professor and he is uh, proposing a solution, a once and for all solution to the number one problem on the planet Earth. And it was really earth shaking. So you had you know, people on B BBC and C-SPAN and everybody, all the pundits were discussing, you know, this professor, you know, where is he coming from? How is he saying this? And blah, blah, blah. Uh, white people had a reaction to it. Black people had a reaction to it. Um, so it was very profound. So again, people know him just for that speech, but others know like an entire lifetime of commitment to black liberation on various fronts as an educator, as a community uh, worker at Restoration in New York, where they had all kinds of community programs, as the uh, proprietor of Blacknificent Books and Bainu Cultural Center, bringing in authors and speakers. So, you know, really, you know, for the billboard, we put up Legacy of Greatness, but we, in retrospect, I wanted to call it Legacy of Blacknificence. So we even coined the term Blacknificent. That was a name. And now you'll see people have T-shirts that have the wrong definition, by the way, of Blacknificent, because they say, oh, it's about being melanated and your chocolatey goodness. I'm like, no, that's not Blacknificent. Blacknificent is about um, thoughts, words, and deeds wow. that supersede being magnificent in every area of human activity. So our, our tagline for the bookstore was, we are more than magnificent, we are Blacknificent. And part of it is that in the English language, anytime you say Black is supposed to be bad, so it's like, okay, that means the English language isn't doing its job. So we have to coin our own words. And from that, that's where we came up with Blacknificent, which, you know, my father trademarked and whatever. Blacknificent, Blacktacular, um, black excellent, right? We have all these different terms that right, we call it. Right. And, you know, from that, that's also where we got the idea of this shouldn't only just be an English language. We should also have words like abibitumi. So when I first came to Ghana, there wasn't a discourse on black power. There was a discourse on uh, which is if you're going to church and you see a white man, you can go back because you've seen God, quote unquote. Yeah. Like that's not a yeah. good discourse for black people. Yeah. So it's like, well, if yeah. that discourse isn't already here, then we need to bring that discourse into being. So if you know that there are already words like abibimain, which is quote unquote Africa, literally the, the land of black people or nation of black people. That's the word for Africa, right? Abibimain. You have words like abibidru, which is like indigenous medicine. You have words like obibini. So it's like, we can look at the words that are already here. And that's my background in linguistics. We can coin words in chi too, right? Like abibitumi, like abibifahudie. So you know fahudie exists. That's like yeah. taking your body and controlling it. Like that's fahudie. But now we can have a Bibi Fahudia, that's now Black Liberation, right? You have right. words like Wanwa. So we recently, just a couple of weeks ago, coined the term a Bibi Wanwa for Black excellence, right? That's like, oh, it's, and yeah, Wanwa Kike, and yeah, a Bibi Wanwa Kasa, right? So now you can imagine what does a Bibi, what could qualify as a Bibi Wanwa? Oh, that Kente cloth, that's a Bibi Wanwa. Oh, that building over there, that's a Bibi Wanwa. These are Black people who are doing things beyond imagination. So it's like blacknificence, right? So these are just some That's of the things. Great. And, you know, anyone who uses the term blacknificent, they're actually honoring my father, whether they know it or not. Or you've seen a T-shirt with these terms on it. So all of the words like spec blackular, right? We coined that term. And like it ended up just being a thing where everybody in the Raleigh community who would come to the Bookstore and Cultural Center, they would come in and say, oh, I got a new one. I got a new one. <laughs> blackderful, <laughs> right? It's not wonderful. It's blackderful. And now they're actually seeing for the first time, you know, something different from the black cat cross your path and that's bad, or the villain wears black, or Black Tuesday, or it was a black, black day. It's like, no, 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 black is good. And this yeah. is even tapping into our own languages, because in the Songhoi language, anytime they want to use something like in Pigu, you say Papa, instead of saying Papa, they say Bibi, and it means good, it means black first. But anytime they want to describe anything as being good, instead of using a word like papa, these were like uh, hari bibi, that's pure water. Yeah, uh, yeah, sadizal yeah. bibi, that's fertile soil. 
Wanya Bibi, that's the powerful son. So anytime they want to say something is good, powerful, pure, whatever, they use the word Bibi, which is the same Bibi we still have in the Chi language, but you know, it still it carries a deeper meaning in these languages. So we're actually tapping into this ancestral knowledge that what's going on in the English language isn't universal, nor do we have to follow behind it with conceptual lockdown, as my father Baba Kamal would say. So that's why we're honoring him. That's why we're unveiling a statue. Um, he wrote 31 books. He wrote 31? 31, 31 books. I counted them. And sometimes in interviews, he would say, you know, I have 16, 17 books. There are books he never even published, but we have the manuscripts. So we're resurrecting Black Nificent books and more. The ones that people know him for are like the last book. If you look up the last book, the last time I checked it on Krakazan, it was going for like $500, you know, out of print, very hard to get, you know, out of circulation. Uh, the last book by Nana Kamal Kanban. Uh, somewhere even like, you know, they do price gouging wow. when it's not available for like $1,000. You'll find it online on Krakazan. Um, because this is like when I say that my father became the most hated black man by white people, of course, the most hated black man in the entire world for a period when this storm was going on. Wikipedia pages that were coming up with fake details about him. And like if you just do a search for his name, you'll see like, you know, hundreds of thousands of entries. Um, but his thing was never about, oh, I'm trying to hop in front of a microphone or be controversial. He's like, no, I'm trying to solve the problem that we have as Black people. And everything that we identify as a problem was created by the problem. So if we think our problem is the white Jesus, well, who created the white Jesus? Whoever created the white Jesus, that's the problem. If we think our problem is you know, economics, who created that economic system that we call capitalism or whatever? If we think our problem is you know, drugs in the community, or black on black violence with the guns that they run the community. Well, we don't have any gun factories. Who So who brought the guns? Who brought the drugs into the community? And the answer for all of those things that we think are the problem is the exact same answer. This means we need to go to the source of the problem. And that was an innovation. And he always said that, you know, if you look at COINTELPRO, they said that their idea was to stop the rise of the black messiah. And my father said that the black messiah isn't a person, it's an idea. And that's the idea that he brought forth is that we need to solve the number one problem on the planet Earth. And, you know, it got him friends and it also, you know, got him enemies. Um, but, you know, for us, more than anything he said, it was that he lived his entire life, every single aspect of his life from getting up in the morning to going to sleep at night to even when he's sleeping. He says, you know, he dreams about black liberation. He would tell me a dream about this ancestor who came to him you know, in this dream and so forth. So like literally 24 seven, that's the only thing that he talks about. The only thing he thinks about, the only thing that he writes books about is about black liberation. And for him, the only way he, he would say that, you know, the metaf metaphorically, the white man is like, as long as I am, you can never be. So the only way that we can have black liberation is to deal with that problem. Otherwise we're gonna have a Tulsa all over again. We're gonna have a Wilmington, North Carolina or a Rosewood or an East St. Louis, or you know, Atlanta race, right? Like it's, it's going to happen again because this is what happened in classical Kemet, right? The land of black people, it literally means the land of black people. But look at what happened when we started to allow the Greeks in to study, you know, that was the conquerors that came in to overrun Kemet, right? And then from the yeah. Greeks came the Romans, the Romans came the Arabs to the point now that you have to go to Aswan before you start to see black people. And even though we know when the Arabs got there, 639 in the common era, we know the exact year that they got there. They'll say, we've always been here. Yes, our ancestors built. Those. No, we know the date you got there, <laughs> Arab guy, right? But, you know, this is what's going on. So we can see that there's no sovereignty as long as white people are in the world because they will ensure that the exact same thing they did in Tulsa, the exact same thing they did in Kemet, the exact same thing they did in Palmares in Brazil, the exact same thing that they did anywhere in the entire planet earth that we tried to exercise sovereignty granada under maurice bishop it right after we free ourselves from the french from the brutish uh and then from the spanish i call them the spamish that time and time again what do they do they now practice gunboat diplomacy and they're right there at our shores again so that was uh, an innovation some people liked it some people didn't but that's definitely innovative thinking that yeah we need to actually solve the problem once and for all Otherwise, the problem is going to rear its ugly white head once again. So, you know, we're honoring my father for a lifetime of work, a lifetime of dedication. We are um, 
some of his books are available on a bb2me.com slash shop i can put that into the chat as well a bb2me.com slash shop s-h-o-p and you can actually read his first book black guerrilla warfare in america that uh came out in 1984. that's where he first started talking about getting your different selves together you can read books like food health and you why black people die young you can read books called tips on quick and easy ways black people can commit uh subtle suicide right and that's what he would talk about that there are only two things it's the white people who are committing genocide against us and then they're convincing us to commit subtle suicide against ourselves through the cigarettes that we smoke, through the KFC and Pizza Hut that we eat. And, you know, all these things that they put into our environment that either they're going to kill us directly or they're going to get us to kill ourselves and they're going to make money off of our demising process. Right. So, you know, that's what that book was about. The last book, The Last Black Man Standing. And The Last Black Man Standing is about uh, it eventually became a play. Right. It was developed into a play. like <laughs> when I even think about his impact, someone developed a play and they performed it. Uh, I know in New Jersey, another one in St. Louis, they had different things. But it's about a black man who is living in the future. Right. And he's in a future where he's the very last black man in existence. And he talks about how he ended up becoming the last black man, about how, you know, we spent our money foolishly, how we ate things that killed us, you know, the fast foods. How, you know, we drank the liquor that was brought into our community. We used the guns that they brought into our communities. And, you know, the uh, the diseases that they brought into our communities. There's actually, I, I spoke about this in another interview, that in Umzansi, you have uh, this guy, Dr. Death, right? Wow. Wuta Basun, who actually was using anthrax and trying to find uh, what they call a RICO virus, a racially coordinated virus that would only kill black people. Uh, there's another documentary called Cold Case Hammer's Dole. Where the documentarian was initially trying to find out who killed Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the UN, but he stumbled upon Saimar, the South African Institute of Maritime Research, and someone who was part of it said, "What we used to do is we would uh, have a free health clinic in the black community, so wait till the Bantu stands, whatever, and it's a free health clinic. But what we were doing is that we were secretly injecting the black people with HIV, because this is like in the late 80s, early 90s." He said. The idea was that this was a killer. And what we could do is just wipe all the black people off of the face of the planet Earth without having to fire a single shot. Because once they get the HIV, they'll sleep with each other. They'll have children. The children will have the AIDS. They will die off. And now it's a white South Africa. And interestingly, there's a town called Orania. I just looked at a documentary about it, um, where it's an all white town in South Africa. No black people are allowed there. And you know, I think I saw a video about that place. Yeah, that was their vision, but they were going to use viruses and anthrax and so forth. And uh, Wouter Basun, during so-called apartheid, he had Project Coast. Yeah. And what they would do is that they would uh, kidnap activists and they would experiment on them because they're trying to find something that will only kill black people, won't kill white people, will only kill black people. And that was even their hope with COVID. When you look at how you know excited they were, oh, Africa's really gonna get torn up with COVID. Oh wow, yeah, it's really because they don't wash their hands. And it didn't happen. It did not uh, happen. Actually, yeah. <laughs> and then we're sitting here and we're eating our prekese, and we're eating our hintia, and we're eating our ostrovisa, we're eating our famwisa, we're eating our abedru, and the COVID barely even touches us compared to them. And like, what happened? What happened? Yeah, they they thought everybody was, gonna... was shocked. To this day, they they're still shocked. going to be the new Miami, where they're just going to come here, sun and surfing all the time. <laughs> no, no black people to deal with. They get all the diamonds, all the gold, all the bauxite, all the columbium, the tantalum. They're going to get everything that they want, the uranium, and they're just going to laugh all the way. But it didn't work out like that. But that's their greatest dream, is that how can we find a once and, so, once and for all solution to their problem, which is us, right? They're like, as long as we're here, they can't steal all the resources because we always want to get a 1% cut of the oil, right? So how can we get 100%? We don't want black people to even get that 1%. How do you get 100%? Okay, wipe them off the face of the planet Earth. But to come back to the documentary, this guy was part of the South Africa Institute of Maritime Research. And he said that that's what they were doing, Wouter Basun, once they kidnapped these anti-apartheid activists, that they would experiment on them. And when they died, they would take a helicopter and then drop the body off of the coast. That's why they called it Project Coast. And before Mandela came to power in the ANC, 
all of the files, they transferred those files to Washington, D.C. And interestingly enough, the, uh, the South Africans said that they got their inspiration of how to do that from America because you I have the syphilis. Exactly. And if you read um, Medical Apartheid by uh, Nana Harriet Washington, she actually goes into you know, these places where they would release mosquitoes in a black community because they want to see how a uh, dengue fever or yellow fever will proliferate amongst black people exclusively, or, you know, all these experiments and so forth, injecting people, the forced sterilization campaigns under the guise of eugenics, just, you know, you name it, the abortion mm -hmm. clinics that are only in the black community, proliferate the black community. Meanwhile, they have fertility clinics in the white community, that all of this is, you know, just different aspects of the genocide. So if you're not clear on the genocide, if you don't know about Samar, if you don't know about Wutter Basun, if you don't know about, you know, the Tuskegee experiment, none of these are, yes, this is an excellent book. I read it cover to cover and I would, you know, definitely, it's very well researched. So this isn't like her giving opinions. Oh, I look bad. I don't know. She said on this date, this is what they did with the injections. On this date, this is what they did in this community to release mosquitoes. On this date, they released other mosquitoes who they knew were infected with this, you know, fever. On this date, they uh, would put, um, what do they call this, radioactive isotopes and lodge them into the backs of black prisoners. They lodge radioactive isotopes into the backs of black prisoners in order to see how the radioactivity would have an impact on them long longitudinally. You understand? So if you don't know this, so then you're saying, oh, this is our development partners. Oh, there, there are good, uh, you know, <laughs> there are our post-colonial development partners, but you don't know that everything that they're doing is to ensure their survival. Even if they're giving you aid, it's to ensure their survival. And we can go deeper into some of those other conversations. But when we have the abibi to me conference, this is a space that's not controlled by white people. You understand? So if we're on Facebook, they'll say, oh, you're talking to black, we'll put you in Facebook jail. That's why we have the digital version of a bb 2 me headquarters, which is a bb 2 mecom where we can talk about whatever we need to talk about, right? Uh, how to stop genocide, right? They don't want you to even talk about that on their platforms. But this is why not only we have to advocate verbally of having our own platforms, this is a platform that we've already created. And then a bb 2 me headquarters is the physical manifestation of that as well, that this is an all-Black space where we can talk about what we need to talk about. We can present models for Black liberation. We can show models of Black survival from the block making machines that we have on site to the solar to, you know, you name it. This is about how do we actually get free? And can you really be free if you're dependent on your enemy who you know is committing genocide? And I'll probably close this point with this. There's an ancestor, I would say a grandcestor named Nana Nkosi Mundari, and he has a talk called The Killer in the House. The and killer he of the house. A killer in the house, right? And he talks about how we have inappropriate behavior because imagine that you're up here and you're washing dishes. You're saying, if only we can wash the dishes right. But meanwhile, there's a killer in the house. Or if only I can sweep, you know, the floor right. You know, if we're in, I need to just mop it right. But there's a killer in the house. Or I, I got to go and do my homework. You know, if only we can get good education, then everything will change. But there's a killer in the house. And this is essentially what we're doing, right? We're saying, if only we can vote for the right candidate, but there's genocide going on against black people globally. You understand? Well, if only we can wear a three-piece suit, then they'll respect us because we have respectability politics. But, you know, the very first concentration camp was against the Herero and the Nama people in Namibia. Are you aware? It's not the so-called Jews during the so-called Holocaust. The first concentration camp was the Nama and the Herero people in Namibia. Are you aware of that? And if you are not aware of that, one, why are you not aware of it? One is because they don't want you to know about it. But once you know about it, now what do you do differently? How do you yeah. behave differently? How do you yeah. create your own species so you can deal with how then there shouldn't be another concentration camp? Because literally they could do the same thing. And they'll just say, this is where we're doing a visa lottery <laughs> to go to the United Snakes. Look at all the Ghanaians who are lined up. And guess what? That's the next concentration camp that they're doing again. It's not very difficult for them to repeat what they did in the past, but you have to even know what they did in the past. You have to know that Tasmania had some of the blackest people on the planet Earth, like Sudan black, right? Somalia black, but they exterminated every single last one off the face of the planet Earth. There's no single full-blooded Tasmanian. They used to call it Lutrivita. They exterminated every single last one off the face of the planet Earth. There's none. 
the only ones who have a bit of the bloodline is because they raped some of the women and they allowed the half caste children to, you know, proliferate. But again, the last one was called Truganini. Her name was true. I should say Nana Truganini out of respect. And, you know, this is uh, something that my father used to say that their capacity for uh, genocide is not in their past. It's in their future. You understand? But you have to even know that that happened in the past to even know what you should do to protect yourself from the killer who's in your house right now. And sometimes people say, oh, you shouldn't blame white people. You should take responsibility. Well, if you have a killer in your house, the first thing to do to take responsibility is to do something about the killer in your house. If you say it's taking responsibility to wash your dishes. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's inappropriate behavior. You know, keeping your house clean is a responsible act to do, but it becomes irresponsible when you have a killer in your house who you refuse to recognize or deal with appropriately. So we're honoring Baba Kamal. We have the Abibi Tumi conference. We have the Sankofa journey. There's a proverb in Chi that says, Obi finding nine million to see us you. And it translates to a person doesn't test the depth of the river with both feet. So the Sankofa journey is two weeks where you can come and find out what Ghana is all about, right? How can I be here and be so successful, right? Uh, I'm sure there are people who are richer than me and whatever have prestige. But you know, I'm a prof I'm doing well for myself, right? I'm a professor at the at the university and a very respected professor at the premier university in Ghana, right? No disrespect to Tech or UCC, but the premier <laughs> university in Ghana. I'm installed <laughs> as Bamuchi Domhini here at Equipin Mampon, right? I have a wife and five children here. I brought both of my parents to repatriate and got all of us citizenship. How do we do this? We have you know a partnership that we are entering into with Diaspora Affairs now. We're making impacts. We are multi-award winning, right? All these things that we're doing, but how can we do that so that we can actually build up the land of Black people and stop building up the land of our enemies? Because as long as we're in places like Ku Klux Canada, as long as we're in places like the United Snakes, as long as we're in places like the UKKK, as long as we are in the lands of the Vermins or the Spamish or the Stench, that they are just going to take all of our time, our energy, our resources, our money, and our spirit. My father called it terms, T-E-R-M-S, time, energy, resources, money, and spirit. And they're going to use that to build their skyscrapers and their prisons. And they're going to use that to buy the bullets that shoot us down the streets. And what can we do here in the land of Black people so that even here, that we're actually building up our own land rather than exporting our raw materials? So they can continue to commit genocide against us on a global scale. That you said time, energy, resources, money, and spirit. And, and so that's so a term. formulation of my father, Nana Kamal Kanban. Time, energy, resources, money, and spirit. And the money, the M can stand for money. It can also stand for material. And my father's original definition of it, he uh, referred to it in terms of material, because the material can also yeah. subsume money I'm underneath it. I'm putting it on the screen right now. Exactly. Terms. And if we're looking for black liberation, then that happens on our own terms. This means that we're not going to get free as a people when we spend the majority of our time working at Lockheed Martin and IBM and, you know, crack a book or nitwit or anything else. We're not going to get liberation if we're spending our energy building up the lands of our enemies who are committing genocide. We spend our resources, our money and our spirit. So, you know, it's ultimately about redirecting those things. And there's a proverb that I like to cite in Wolof, which translates to water does not forget its path. So essentially the paths, the channels that are carved out is where the water will flow. So now it's up to those of us who repatriate, those of us who are already here to carve those channels so that this water in the sense of, you know, the human being is made up of 70% water. And we act a lot like water because you'll see people who are trying to go to this channel. Oh, this is a good channel. Let me follow that channel. This, that's what water does. It goes to a hot channel to find out what's going on. But now this is a channel towards black liberation. This is the highway to black liberation. And, uh, you know, nowadays, white people on white platforms, they like to talk about intersectionality, brown and black power and this and that. And I say, if we have a highway to black liberation, that's our destination. Well, how do you get to your destination when you're stopping at an intersection every 10 feet? Well, this is the reason why they keep putting intersections in front of us, because you can never have any type of substantive arrival, you know, ETA, when you got to stop here. Now you got to stop there. You got to stop there. We're trying to get towards Abibi Fahudia. We're trying to get towards Black liberation. And that's only going to happen on our own terms. 
on our own time, mm -hmm. energy, resources, money slash material, and our spirit. So um, I would like to encourage all of your viewers to come to the, the Black viewers, only Black viewers. I would like to encourage all of your Black viewers to come to the abibi to me conference. I'd like to encourage your Black viewers to download the abibi to me app and come to the site. This is what they call a safe space, right, for Black people. And as always, white people like to try to invade safe spaces, just like they did in Rosewood. But the conference is a place where we can come together, just like, you know, the entire white world came together for the Berlin Conference. Some people aren't aware that the United Snakes was uh, represented at the Berlin Conference. Some people think Russia is our great friend, but they were also represented at the Berlin Conference. All of them came together. And guess what? All of their uh, treaty partners who signed treaties with them, whether it be the Fontes or you name it, the guy, you name it. They didn't invite any of their partners to the Berlin Conference. That should tell you something. So when we have our conferences about how to solve our problems, we should also not invite the ones who are committing genocide because otherwise we would have a killer in the house. And this is the one house where that killer is excluded from. So uh, the conference, the Sankofa Journey, Repatriate the Ghana for those who are serious about being here uh, on a permanent basis. And when you do so, you're literally robbing Fort Knox because all the money you would have spent on your mortgage in the United Snakes all the money you would have spent on your car note in Ku Klux Canada, all the money you would have spent on healthcare in the UKKK, all of that money, all of that time, energy, resources, all of that is going to come here. And now we can actually build our land where we can do whatever we need to do to build it up and then also to defend it. And then also to ensure that our enemies don't have the ability to make this another Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you so much for all your information. Uh, we've been talking for just over an hour now. I do have to wrap up. It's been really, Excellent. really informative. So, so informative. And everyone who's watching, all of our Black viewers, as he has said, um, come to the conference. It is happening in Ghana in September, the 6th to the 8th. Come and experience uh, amazing speakers. There's going to be performances, creative arts, uh, relevant conversations on building on the black experience building on how black people can have liberation so as he said go to this link conference.abibitumi.com so that you can register to be there you don't want to miss out on this conference it's going to be so so fantastic and mm -hmm. if you are looking to uh, come to ghana and learn about the experience sankofajourney.com he will take you, he, he and his team will take you through an amazing experience um, and it will change your life. Everybody I know who comes to Ghana always talks about how life-changing it is. Life-changing to the point that a lot of people decide to, you know, make a move or invest, partner with people, whatever it may be, it, it changes something inside of them. And I promise you that if you do this cycle of journey, you'll feel the same way. And then the website, Repatriate to Ghana, where you can um, look at ways to move to Ghana because he has done it. As he said, he's brought his entire family and helped them to get citizenship. So he can certainly guide you in the right direction on what you need to do if you also want to do the same. Um, if you want to look at his father's book, oh, I want to show you the father, his father's book the, um, on the screen. Let me do that right now. The last book by Nana Kamal Kambon. So you can see it when you're looking for it. Um, you know what it looks like, but here it is. I think we lost him. His network is fading. His network is fading out. So um, this was the book, the last book by Nana Kamal Kambon. If you are interested in getting the book, just go to his website and you can actually uh, pick up a copy of this book. There are very few available. Let me bring him back to the yeah. stage. So, um, I was just showing the book on the screen. I don't know if you can see it yes. here. Yeah. And, and that's the um, digital okay. copy that you can get. And as soon as you purchase it, you can download it and start reading it immediately. Um, this, this is a set of essays on, um, you know, dozens and dozens of topics. Some of uh, my father's writings are there. An amazing book. And that's me on the cover, as a matter of fact, standing in front of Blacknificent Books and more there in uh, North Carolina. And it also includes the full version of um, the last black man standing before there was, uh, you know, they call it mainstream social media. I don't call it mainstream. I call it a stagnant cesspool. But, you know, people took that uh, write up that my father wrote in the, la the final call actually was where it was first published. 
someone put it on email and it was like going all throughout the entire world, the, the last black man standing. So the full version of the last black man standing is in there. It, it went not viral, it went medicinal. For compounds, we don't go viral, we go medicinal. So, you know, but it became something that, like I mentioned, it was developed into a play, a very, very powerful book. And, you know, in that book as well, uh, Baba Kamal shared his ideas about how we can solve our number one problem as black people. So that's available. Some of uh, Nana Kamal Kanban's other books are available. And that's my site, uh, obadulekanban.com. Uh, you can also get it through the shop on abibitumi.com. Uh, all of my father's books that are available are there. Um, he has about 16 or 17 that are published. We have additional ones that we're republishing that were out of print. And then also others that he never published, but we're going to look to publish those. Interestingly, he had a couple of books that were so controversial, which is why he decided not to publish them. Um, but we'll, under advisement, decide you know how to move forward those. But it will be under the Blacknificent uh, Publishing House uh, label. And again, that's the word that he coined, that he invented. And we're bringing back the concept of Blacknificent, or as we could say, Abibi Wanwa. We're more than magnificent. We are Blacknificent. As are you, Abby Prosper, and I thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything today, for all the information. Looking forward to the conference in September. And I hope that all of you watching will be able to make it to the conference. Uh, if you can't make it to the conference, I'm sure you can stay up to date when you follow the website and get information about it and see what's going on, see who the speakers are. Um, even if you can't watch it live, I'm sure that will be recorded, that will be posted onto the website. Um, I see him being, I see you being the person who will drive the traffic to your website rather than relying on other sources uh, to share the information, which is very key to having control over the content and the storytelling of our people and our narrative and making sure to get the liberation of African people. So thank you so much. This has been a really engaging conversation. And um, I, you just told me in the chat, it'll be online and virtual. Okay, perfect. So those who can't come can watch it online. Um, just go to the website and register, and then you'll get all the information on how you can watch it virtually, which is great. That's the, one of the great things about the internet is being able to still have a community, even with people who, for reasons beyond their control, maybe they might not be able to make it. So that's really wonderful that you have it as um, available. And the conference in person is in Kyapim Mampong. So exactly. if you're coming to Ghana and you're, or if you're already in Ghana, make sure that you plan the journey, plan the trip when you're going out there. Um, it is in the Eastern region of Ghana. It is not in Greater Accra. So you'll drive out of Greater Accra to get there. And I promise you, it'll be a place where the air is much cleaner and much fresher and there's lots of green. Um, my, my mom's side of the family is from the Eastern region. And so mm. whenever I go, I notice how much more green it is than being in greater Accra. So, That's right. um, so yeah, looking forward to that. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching today. I appreciate you. Um, if you have any comments or questions, make sure that you put them in the comment section, and I'll make sure that he's able to get you know, the information so that he can answer any questions that maybe I might not be able to answer for you. So thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again. Good afternoon.